In this video, I'll show you one example where the function, one non-trivial example, where the criterion for Riemann integrability is heavily used. And that's the another example which will show you that why the Riemann integration is so inconvenient for the analysis purposes. Uh, look at the function. That's a function which is called the Riemann function, suggested by Riemann, I suppose. So it's a function which is defined like this. It's a function which returns uh, number 1 on Q if X is the rational number PQ with the extra assumption that P and Q are co-prime. So in fact, for the rational number, which is given in the canonical form, uh, canonical means that P is an integer and Q is the positive integer, uh, it just returns the 1 over denominator and it returns 0 in any other case. This is a function, very similar to the Dirichlet function, but the difference is we now take 1 on Q rather than just 1. And this function is in fact is Riemann integrable. Uh, however, however, showing this is not an easy task. Uh, again, I just if you watch the previous uh, video, you know that uh, the Riemann integration is something which is missing the comparison principle. If there was a comparison principle for Riemann integration, then the showing that this function is Riemann integrable would be much easier because this function obviously is controlled by constant function 1 over second 0, 1, of course. Actually, over every second. However, because we don't have comparison principle, every time we have to test a function for Riemann integrability, if this function is not continuous, like this one, you, we, have to do, we have to do quite an effort in order to show that. So, I call it lemma, and in this lemma I'll show that this function is integrable over the segment 0, 1. In fact, it will be integrable over any segment, a, b, but I'll just do it for 0, 1 for just for the simplicity. So we start because the only way to prove that the function is human integrable is by this criterion, which I mentioned on the previous in the previous video. I start with a partition of 0, 1. Any partition. The only thing I know about this partition is that uh, I will start, I will at once at, at some stage I will start pushing the diameter of this partition to zero. So I have this extra concepts, the minimal value of my function over the every segment, and we know this minimal value is zero. Uh, we have the max value, which is which may be different, for, and that's the max value which we're going to estimate in a sec. So in order to estimate this max value, what I will do is this. I'll look at the inequality f bigger than some number b. What is number b? I won't tell you at the moment. Uh, I will tell you how we choose this number b a little bit later. But just what I will do, I will analyze this inequality, f of x bigger than b. Uh, b is a positive number, that's all we know for now. Uh, so look at this, what happens. If my x is a rational number, p and q, then in order for this to happen, because the function at this point will return 1 on q, in order for this to happen, I obviously need something like this, which also means that the, if I just restate it in terms of Q, that the Q is number like so, which means that for this to happen, which means for no, like, which is equivalent to for this to happen, you need your X to be one of these numbers where S is the integral part of one on B, because Q is the denominator of your S now of your X number, and your X number comes from the integral zero one. That's all possibilities for the X value. All of these fractions in the integral 0, 1 with the denominator s, they are here. Some of them will drop out because actually not all of these fractions will, will match this condition, but it doesn't matter. It just this is very, like this is excessive state, as set. It has more actually points than the actual set of points for which this will happen. And remember, s is like, that's, the, that's how s is connected with b. Now, what I will do now, what I will do now, I will split these intervals, or the indices I use to index these points, in two subsets. So, I'll split this in two subsets. One of them is this subset. 
that's a subset where the oscillation, remember the oscillation is the difference between this and this. In, in, our, in this example, of course, oscillation is just equal to the m k. So the points, the indices for which the oscillation is bigger this, than this chosen number b, we know that for this to happen, you, uh, the interval must have one of these points, must have one of these points. So we know that the number of such indices, and you see these vertical bars indicate the number of, they place uh, the at most s such indices exist. I call this set K1, capital K1. Now, the rest of the indices, so the indices where the oscillation is in fact less than B, less or equal than B, it will be the rest of the indices, so we have altogether N take S indices like so. And I will call this set K1. Now, look, I start my analysis, so I have to apply the criterion for Riemann integration. So I fix an epsilon, positive epsilon. I just introduce this notation for the diameter of my partition. And now I start my analysis. Look at this. I start with the sum. I have to analyze. I'll split the sum into two subsums. One of them will be over this set of indices. The other one will be over this set of indices. Here's my splitting. And now I'll start estimate my subsums individually. First, I will estimate this subsum. Then I will estimate this one. When I estimate this, because over this set of indices, we say we can we can't say much about oscillation. The most we can say is that the oscillation is less than one. Number of elements here is s, and each individual interval is controlled by the diameter. So this one will be controlled by this number, s for the number of elements of my summation, and d to control the length of the interval. Amiga is just controlled by one. Now for second sum, we will we'll be more sharp in our estimate because for the second set of indices we can say more about the omega. We can say that the omega is in fact less than b. And uh, for the rest of the sum, I'll just take the sum now over the complete set of indices rather than just this k2 set and it will be all of this delta k2. We know that this actually the sum is in fact 1 because that's the, that's the complete length of your interval 0, 1. So my estimate becomes like this. Now time has come to, to make the choice for the B. Remember I told you that remember I told you that we will choose this B later, and now I choose my B. That's how I choose my B. It will be root of G. If I do that, my estimate becomes simple, as simple as this. Again, look listen to this. For a fixed epsilon and for a partition with this particular choice particular value of a diameter, I estimated my sum of the oscillations over each individual interval of that partition, like this, with the particular smart choice of the value b. Now I say this. Now I choose my delta to be epsilon squared. So for this fixed epsilon, I'll choose this particular choice. I'll make this choice of, a, of delta. And then listen what happens if my partition is such that the length of this partition is less than delta, then this sum will be less than 2 epsilon. And that's, that's the definition of a limit. It means that this sum will go to 0 when the diameter of a partition goes to 0. For every positive epsilon, I presented a choice for a delta such that this happens. And that's why this function is Riemann integrable. It's not a trivial proof. It's not a trivial proof, but that's a good example. It's it's a good example of really deep fundamental way the analysis works.